Dr. Lisa Coleman, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, and I use she and her pronouns. I hope that everyone is taking very good care. We are thrilled to welcome you to our Transformation Talk series where we spot leaders and we learn from their journeys and gain knowledge about how to be agents working toward transformational change across our organizations. In OGI, we engage global diversity and inclusion principles with an intersectional focus on leadership, nimbleness, inclusivity, resilience, transformation, growth mindsets, design thinking, and adaptivity in all of our work. Transformation Talks is part of our NYU's Be Together initiative centering on innovating, acting, and transforming together. And today, we have the distinct honor to welcome Lisa Sherman. Lisa Sherman is an innovative leader and accomplished operating executive with deep experience in private and nonprofit sectors. She has over 35 years of experience in building, transforming, and growing organizations. As the president and CEO of the Ad Council, she leads all aspects of this national institution, Working at the intersection of media, marketing, technology, entertainment, and advertising, the Ad Council convenes the world's best marketers to create public engagement campaigns. By leveraging leading edge products, approaches, and digital technologies, the organization tack tackles the most pressing issues facing the country. Under her leadership, the Ad Council immediately responded to the COVID pandemic with life-saving information about wearing masks, social distancing, mental health, and staying home when possible. And in 2021, the Ad Council launched the COVID-19 Vaccine Education Initiative, which is the largest and most urgent communications effort in American history. Prior to the Ad Council, Lisa was at Viacom, where she built a powerful media business, launching and leading Logo TV, the first cable network for LGBTQ audiences. She also held a number of senior operating roles at, at Verizon and agency Hill Holiday and the Women's Sports Network and the VCA-backed marketing company she co-founded. Lisa is a thought leader, frequent public speaker, and active participant on several boards. In 2021, Lisa joined the board of H Code, a privately held company and the largest tech enabled multicultural dig digital marketplace that offers an end to end solution for brand and uh, for, excuse me, for brands and publishers. In addition, she is the advisor to the Guild Education and EdTech Unicorn, preparing the workforce for, for today for the jobs for tomorrow and a member of the Board of Trustees at Dickinson College, her alma mater. In 2017, in 2021, Lisa was also named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business. And in 2020, she was recognized as the Marketer of the Year by the American Marketing Association. To say that Lisa is an extraordinary and tremendous leader is quite the understatement as her bio illustrates. And I have the pleasure of being with you today, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. And it's a pleasure to, to be a colleague with you and also be friends with you. So thank you again. We're well, gonna kick it off really, we're gonna kick it off with the first question. So, uh, I'd like to begin as I do with all of our transformation talk uh, guests. Uh, as an accomplished leader and respected change agent, how do you think of the definitions of progress of success as you think about transformation, particularly in your role as an executive leader? Well, again, thanks for having me. Great to see you. Um, I'm going to quote our dear friend Shelly Zalas. She says, if you can't measure it, you can't treasure it. And so measurement is a very key part of everything we do at the Ad Council. You know, all the work we do, uh, we measure that uh, very specifically, trying to really understand the impact we're having for all of the campaigns that we, that we launch. Sometimes that's easier than others because some of the changes that we're asking for are attitude and behavior change. And, and first of all, we know that attitudes and behaviors take time to change, so we have to measure them over time. And we tend to stick with issues for the long haul as a result of that. Others are, are more discreet and easier to, to uh, measure. So measurement is core to the work that we do. And then as a leader, you know, um, I, I'm always focused on really creating an environment where our teams can do their best work. Uh, I, I fundamentally believe that it's a vibrant culture that yields brilliant work and business impact. And I think that for me, that's always meant developing and living by a set of shared values, living by the golden rule, 
um, the onus is, I think, on the leadership to provide a clear vision for an organization, you know, where we're going and why. And then, you know, I, everybody has their own styles, but for me, it's always about empowering people to make it happen. You know, hire really smart, great people who probably know and should know more than you in many ways and let them do their thing. If they know where we're headed, uh, I have every confidence that they will, they will get us there. And I think to do that, to really have people feel empowered, it's, it's, it's important to create that environment where people feel psychologically safe, like they can be themselves. Um, they're afraid, they're, they're not afraid to take risks. Uh, they're not going to get slapped for making mistakes uh, and really encourage them to test new ideas and ways of doing things. So that's sort of my, 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 my focus. Thank you so much. And that leads us into the next question as you talk about empowering others, and in particular, thinking about this idea of risk. So in our office, we work across uh, disciplines, areas, and we're con consistently advocating for a climate where people embrace authenticity. So to go back to that idea, right, of, of, of psychological safety. And as some know, and as we just discussed, you were the creator of Logo Channel. So could you describe some of the core strengths as you think about empowering others, right? And some of the core strengths that are necessary for emerging leaders. And particularly as we think also at this idea of taking strategic risks, making mistakes. So talk to us a little bit about that as well. Sure, well, you know, Logo, I think, as you know, is the first ever um, cable network, national table network targeting the LGBTQ audience. And it was really at the time in 2005, the only, you know, gay people were the only folks that weren't somehow represented on television with their own channel. You know, we had kids for Nickelodeon, we had country music for, you know, country music lovers and, and, and you know, Telemundo and Univision for um, Hispanic audiences, but uh, there was nothing for gay people. And you know, I, I really believe that um, seeing yourself, being seen and heard um, and having your stories told in authentic um, ways was is critically important. It's very validating and it was at the core of our mission at Logo. You know, I think in the past we saw gay people being sort of the center of the story, the, the stereotype. And our focus was really to accurately portray this very diverse community, uh, beautiful community with, with authentic stories that put them at the center of the story. And so I think this notion of being yourself, whether it's seeing it reflected on TV or in the workplace is absolutely critical for, for leaders and, and um, to think about and to try and create environments where people can bring their full selves to work. Um, you know, I was at the court in the corporate closet for many years when I was at Verizon. Um, and I will tell you that I didn't think it was safe to be my full self. Um, when I finally came out and it took a long time, um, I never realized how much energy it took to hide. And then when I could pour all of that energy that I'd been consuming, trying to be somebody else, um, it was all available to be the more creative and more engaged. And the quality of my work experience exponentially improved. And I have to say the quality of my work exponentially improved. So there was a huge lesson in that. And, and then I think, um, I think one other thing I would point, you know, sort of say, is that for me, aligning my work with passions that I have have been critically important. Like you're, if I'm able to work fully where my head and my heart are connected to the work, um, it's when I'm the happiest and it's frankly when I'm the most effective. Thank you again. Thank you again. And thank you for talking with us a little bit about that corporate closet, right? And then sort of what that what that's like to then and, and of course to create logo, which all I, there are so many of us out there, they're so thankful that you did that as well. So thank you very much. So as and this problem, maybe this leads into my next question, which is really about um challenges and uh, thinking about things that have challenged you and what you're most proud of. I have a friend 
who says um, this, uh, asks the question, what would your eight-year-old self think of yourself today? And I laugh because I'm not sure my eight-year-old self imagined anything that I'm doing today. And so, um, but then I think about some of the challenges, right, that we all have to uh, uh, go through. And then also some of the things that we're proud of. So maybe this is, you've already, but maybe we could talk, you could talk a little bit more about that, particularly for some of our emerging leaders, because of course they're gonna face challenges and how to navigate those. Mm hmm. Yeah, happy, happy to talk about that. You know, I think um, challenges are just part of life, I think. And I also think that I have um, done the most growing as an individual um, when I have been challenged uh, and I have been stretched and I have had to sort of dig deep to, um, you know, sort of stay um, positive, uh, or maybe not so positive. And I think we have to embrace those moments, you know, and use them as learning experiences, because if things are just too easy, um, I think we get soft, you know, I think we, we lose our edge. And so I would really encourage, um, people to think about that, to stretch yourself, uh, so that you can, um, be challenged and feel challenged. And, and I will tell you that, you know, when I finally came out of the closet at Verizon, I had this big aha moment because what I was most afraid of was, you know, being rejected and, 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 and not being accepted for who I was. And what I realized was that when I actually went to talk to the CEO, I was expanding his imagination. He didn't know a lot of gay people. He didn't understand sort of what we and how we, I was struggling at the company. And it was so impactful that that conversation motivated him to implement domestic partnership benefits at the company. Like I never could have imagined that my biggest fear in that moment of sharing my truth could have had such a positive impact on so many people at Verizon, and then and then I like to joke with I left um, Verizon because I didn't feel comfortable being out, and then I um, went off to run Logo TV, where I frankly was like a professional lesbian. You know, it was like where's look at the irony in that. <laughs> and then I will say one more thing. You know, um, this story of mine. I gave a speech one day, and and somebody in the audience was from Harvard Business School, and approached me afterwards and asked me if we could do a case study, they could do a case study on this. And, you know, I, I figured it's the only way I'm going to get to Harvard, not like, unlike you, who <laughs> I retired by Harvard. Um, and I, the story was told through the case. It's told a lot. I'm asked to speak about it a lot. And after a while, after years of doing it, I feel like I'm so tired of telling this story. I feel like people are so tired of hearing me say the whole thing, the same thing over and over again. But I will tell you, that every single time I tell this story, inevitably somebody comes up to me or sends me a note to say that they were that person in the closet mm -hmm. all those years and that they were so happy that I told the story. So I really feel like I have to keep telling it because I think it, it does really help expand people's imaginations and it gives people the inspiration and the courage to maybe make a different choice for themselves. Thank you so much for saying that. One of the things I'm most interested in is this the idea of reimagination and imagineering, right? And so I really like how you talked about this, in particular in relation to the CEO, right? And reimagining and opening the space. So, um, so this actually speaks right to our next question, which is really about innovation. And innovation is about reimagining, right? And so as the president and CEO of the Ad Council, could you talk to us a little bit about the role that innovation plays? We see innovations related to global diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging principles, and particularly, even as we read your bio, right, you've been responsive. Uh, we think about disruptions, and so COVID was a big dis has been a big disruption, and we know that you all did a lot of work in this space. So talk to us a little bit about innovation and sort of the work you've been doing there, um, in gen just in general, and then of course, and related to these important principles. Well, first of all, I couldn't agree more. I don't think you can have innovation without diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and belonging. Because I think if 
everyone's sitting around trying to figure out a problem or to think about new ways or better ways of doing things. If it's the same people who have the same experience, who look the same, whose life, whose life, whose lived experience is the same, you don't get any new ideas. Everybody's thinking the same way. And so, you know, I, I really buy into this idea that sometimes we have to flip the org chart almost and have the people that are closest to the work in on the conversations and the reimagining of, of what is, is possible. And, and I'll tell you that, you know, as leaders, we're always charged with creating change, right? That's our job. And, and change is hard and it's challenging. And um, we as an organization at the Ad Council have been on this journey over the last several years. And, you know, there are lots of ways to approach that. Like I sort of, I knew where I think, I knew where we had to go, but I really wanted to bring people along with me. I didn't want to just mandate it because I feel like yeah, people would have done it, but they really probably didn't buy it. And if they don't really buy it, it's never going to take. And so we focused a lot on our culture and our go-to-market strategies and breaking down silos and reducing hierarchy and fostering teamwork and collaboration and being more agile, things that the organization, I think, would really benefit from. And the most gratifying thing is that this year with all the challenges that we had, we had to toss out all the old stuff. We had to really to, like lean on the new ways we were thinking about operating and innovating, or we never could have been as effective at launching the largest public service effort around public education for vaccine education. And I'm just, I think it's the most transformative period we've ever had for the Ad Council in the 80 year history. Um, and it's a true testament, honestly, to our teams and their commitment and their real willingness to go on the journey with me. And um, I am super grateful. Oh, well, that's terrific. And again, speaks to even what you spoke to in the first question about team and building team and, and how important that is. And of course, hiring people and getting people on board. And this idea of the flipping the organization uh, chart is really important. And uh, I know that a lot of our emerging leaders will really appreciate that as we think about co-creation. So I can't believe we're at the end and this is our, my last question. But uh, one of the um, questions here is just, can you talk to us a little bit about maybe a piece of advice that you wish you had been given earlier or something that sustained you? And then lastly, tell us a little bit about something that gives you joy. Um, we we want to make sure that our emerging leaders are not just working themselves to the bone, but also <laughs> really thinking about how they're taking care of themselves and, and, and having some joy in their lives too. So uh, so if you could speak to us about sure. this. Well, well I, gosh, I, I mean, first of all, I have to say hindsight's 2020, right? So we learn a lot as we uh, we have experiences and, and get older and all that stuff. But I, I think one of the big pieces of advice that I wish I had been given is that life doesn't move in a straight line. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, to-do lists don't get checked off in neat sequential order. Sometimes we skip steps and we repeat others. You know, I had my first job out of college at Verizon. Everybody there stayed for 30, 40 years and retired. And I really thought that that was my path. It never even occurred to me that I would take any sort of a turn but as we know, I, I chose to leave because I couldn't reconcile the environment with who I really was. I then went on to launch my own company. And that was the first time I was able to marry my passion with my purpose. And after that, frankly, nothing else would do. But uh, you know, we were hurt when 9-11 happened and our business couldn't sustain itself because it was a young fledgling business. And that was a real tragedy. I mean, it was a, it was a devastation and um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but that led to Logo TV and ultimately the best job on the planet at the Ad Council. So my, my, my trajectory has been anything but a straight line. What is also true is that every single one of those experiences gave me the experience, the relationships, and some more uh, knowledge that led to the next thing. And um, I would say that that is a very, very big lesson. Um, 
And then, you know, there's lots of things that give me joy. Um, I love uh, being with my team. I miss them terribly. Um, I love uh, being with my friends like you when we can meet uh, spontaneously for a meal and being with my family. And I've taken up a COVID hobby of learning how to play golf. That oh, is giving me, okay. <laughs> that gives me joy most of the time, but it's also could be the most frustrating sport. <laughs> That little ball. <laughs> exactly. It is so fresh. Oh, it's a little tough. I do know that. Uh, well, thank you so much. And thank you for talking about all that you have, particularly for our emerging leaders. We're so excited to be able to feature such transformational leaders as yourself. And thank you for all the contributions that you've made to actually improving the lives of so many through all of your work. Thank you again for joining us today, Lisa Sherman. Um, to everyone who is out there in the audience, thank you very much for joining us. We hope that you will continue to follow the Office of Global Inclusion for more transformation talks, as well as join our listserv for updates, events, programs, and additional resources that are available to you. And of course, continue to partner with us as we continue to uh, advance this important work across our institution. Thank you again for being with us today and take good care. Thank you.